We're just going to look at the one verse that we were going to look at two weeks ago, um, and that's Proverbs 23, 7, and we'll, we'll really just look at 23, 6 through 8 to get the context of verse 7. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I pray that tonight that um, I would operate in the power of your Holy Spirit, and that it would be your heart and your mind conveyed, and that you would really bring liberty and um, clarity and 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 uh, freedom and strength to everybody that's gathered here tonight, that these things would <clears throat> really meet them where they're at in their Christian life and um, help them take the next step uh, that you have for them. And uh, I pray that you would just help all of us, every single one of us <clears throat> in this room, apprehend these truths and make them our own and um, apply them to our, our lives. I just thank you for your word and... Uh, particularly the truths we're going to consider were really revolutionary to me when I came across them, uh, mostly from this book. And so I just um, really thankful for these insights and how they tie up <clears throat> a lot of loose ends in the Christian life. And um, I pray that they would have that desired work of helping us to walk fully pleasing to you, Lord. We just love you, and um, we lift up this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Proverbs. 23 6 says this do not eat the bread of a miser nor desire his delicacies for as he thinks in his heart so is he eat and drink he says to you but his heart is not with you the morsel you have eaten you will vomit up and waste your pleasant words do not eat the bread of a miser you know a miser is uh, like scrooge um from that from charles dickinson's classic uh he's a miser someone who who is counting every penny so that he can make as much money as possible in his life. He's a miser. <clears throat> and here Solomon is saying to his son, do not eat the bread of a miser. Now, why would he say that? There's, there's something deeper going on. This, this, and it's, it's really um, evidenced by verse 7 where it says, for as he thinks in his heart, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he, speaking of a man. And, and this idea, um, it comes up elsewhere in Proverbs too, but this idea... That, that he is what he thinks, not really quite so much what he does. You have to understand, so let's, <clears throat> let's kind of try to dissect the first line. Do not eat the bread of a miser. This is clearly saying that someone that you know to be a miser has set bread before you. Well, misers don't do that. <laughs> they hoard everything for themselves. They don't share without a purpose, because all they care about is money and themselves. And so if, he, if a miser, someone that you know to be a miser, has set bread before you, you need to think twice about it. Wisdom would say that he is what he is, and if he's a miser and he set bread before you, there's something else going on than him just being generous and kind, because he's not generous and kind. Now this, <clears throat> this has, I think, many ramifications for Christianity today, though we're not really going to focus on it because we're going to focus on um, verse 7, um, except to say this, that there are a lot of churches, in my experience, um, where they allow people that if they gave five <coughs> minutes thought to their life, they would go, this person is a miser, and yet they allow this person onto the board of deacons or onto the elders board or whatever, and they, they promote that person because that person's wealthy. You know, a lot of churches, the, the way they judge <clears throat> whether, God, uh, whether God's blessing is on a person, whether that person is worthy of promotion um, in spiritual life is the same way the world does. Well, oh, you're wealthy? Well, God's obviously blessed you, so you must be spiritual. And so they start promoting people um, who they should know better than to do that. And, and there are people like this, misers, um, fornicators, um, selfish people, uh, prideful people, that it's so obvious to every single person around them that this person, the main mark of this person is something, is, is a completely ungodly trait, and yet <clears throat> sometimes we as Christians, we find ourselves drawn to that person for one reason or another. Now, why would a person go to eat bread with a miser? In my opinion, there's only one reason, because he's wealthy. And there's, so there's the flip side of it that oftentimes, and this happens, and actually Malcolm taught on this truth um, in the last two months, and it was fantastic, but how churches are embracing ungodly wealthy people for their wealth, and, and it, it's really leavening the whole lump. <clears throat> 
And that's one of the things I love about this church, obviously. It doesn't happen here. You can see the, the, the status of the building and, and everything. And I, I love that about our church because there are a lot of churches that you could go to even nearby and everything's perfect and they have money to spare. But the reason they have money to spare is because they are willfully embracing and, and eating the bread of misers. And, and it has a leavening effect on the spiritual life of the body. And it's very, very bad. So, um, but not to rehash that, because Malcolm did a much better job of it than I, I could. Um, Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacies. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. So as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And the idea is here, it's not so much what he does, it's what he thinks that defines who he is. And this is actually a spiritual truth. And hopefully tonight I will do this justice and we will come to the New Testament conclusion of this very truth that you are what you think about, not so much what you do. You know, And I think that that is a <clears throat> that idea of the New Covenant, that we are justified by faith in Christ and we are... Um, we are have imputed righteousness, and even though it may not always manifest itself in our works, that we are not what we do. We are what we believe about God. That actually defines who we are, what we believe, not what we do. Very important truth. But as a man thinks, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And and if you're catching this, what he's saying here, again, before we move on, is that you know this person to be a miser, and he's being kind to you, but he's not what his actions are. He's what his heart is. And so there is a very practical word of, of warning for you guys, for us, for myself as believers, that when you know a person to be something, don't pretend like they're not that thing just because you need something from them because if they're meeting you on middle ground, there's a reason, and you're going to end up regretting it. You may think, well, it's worth it to get this thing. I need the money or I need whatever it is. And the truth here is, is that you'll vomit it up later. And it will have, you will find it to have not been worth uh, whatever sort of compromise you were willing to make. You will find that it was not worth it. Now, so moving on to this, this spiritual principle, though, that I believe um, uh, inter- weaves itself into the New Testament. And, 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 it, and that may come as sh- a shock because we're in the book of Proverbs and so much of the book of Proverbs um, to be completely honest, is not, uh, some aspect of the book of Proverbs is not completely relevant to us because it's old covenant, okay? Um, but this is one of those truths, like justification by faith, that has always been there. And that was, that surprised me. I think it was at Bible college in one of my classes, it, I had this epiphany that it finally dawned on me. I don't remember who was teaching. Might have been my Genesis class that it dawned on me that even in the Old Testament, in the period of the judges, in the period of the kings, and then in the period of uh, the tabernacle being transformed into the temple, in the temple period, and all these sacrifices, the entire time from Genesis 1-1 to right now, people have always only been justified by faith. Always only justified by faith. That's fundamental doc- biblical doctrine, and, and most Christians are actually unaware of that. They actually think that in the Old Testament that people were made righteous by the sacrifices. They were not. Hebrews makes that very clear, that the blood of an, a bull or a goat could never make the worshiper perfect, could never establish a perfection before God. They were always only Every single person was always only justified by Christ. Now, the sacrifice was an expression of faith, and God honored that, and there's an exchange there. But sacrificing an animal did not cover your sins, believe it or not. And, and, and actually, logically, that's one of the arguments in Hebrews. It never did. You know, Ab- um, Abraham, in my opinion, the most important verse in the Old Testament, was justified by faith in Genesis 15, 6, for believing long before the law was given, long before the covenant of circumcision, long before the sacrifices were initiated. And so this truth, though, this idea that as a man thinks, so he is, this is a lot like justification by faith. This is one of those truths that is intertwines directly and unch- in an unchanged way straight into the new covenant and straight into our day and age and can be taken literally at face value. That today, in the same exact way, as a man thinks, so he is. I have three points. Um, I'm not completely happy with the titles of these points, so for whatever. Um, 
you'll forgive me. Uh, the first one is going to be, uh, so this verse gives us wisdom in, in how to deal with humanity in general. And, and the first point is going to be in dealing with people. The second point is going to be in dealing with your flesh. And then the third point is going to be in dealing with yourself. And, and your self is actually different than your flesh. So in dealing with people, I've already kind of bled into this, but just to, to reiterate this one, this one idea, it doesn't matter what a miser does. It's, it, in his heart, he's a miser, and you should call a miser a miser, and a wolf a wolf, and a fornicator a fornicator. And this is New Testamental too. In Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20, Jesus warned them about the wolves that would come in in sheep's clothing. And he, he talked about uh, a, a, salt wa- a, a fresh spring cannot send forth salt water. And his whole point is, is that a person is what they are on the inside. And in the, in the, in what comes out of this, their heart um, is what defiles them, not what goes in. And this idea that what a person thinks, that is what that person is. And there is a thing where if a miser is a miser, we should call a miser a miser. And we should call a wolf a wolf. And we should call a fornicator a fornicator. Paul says that um, very clearly <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 5. He talks about the, the young man that was um, sleeping with his father's wife. And, and he says, do you guys not judge those who are on the inside? I know we don't judge those on the outside, but we should be judging those inside the church. There should be. Now, uh, to kind of dissect that a little bit, because it's startling to people who are like, well, Jesus said not to judge. There are five words for judge in the New Testament. Crino, diacrino, anacrino, um, catacrino, and another one. And, and, and um, catacrino is the one that means to condemn to hell. Okay, And the, one, the word used for judge there is not catacrino. It's not the one to to judge to hell. It's diacrino, if I remember correctly, dia, dividing, and then crino, to judge, and it means to make a distinction. Do you not make a distinction with believers? And that's why there are a lot of churches that are very, very spiritually unhealthy, because no one in the church will call a fornicator a fornicator and say, hey, you know what? The way you're living is not okay, and God says it's not okay, and there needs to be some division here. There needs to be some separation. Um, We actually have to make a judgment call. Um, in Titus three ten through eleven, I think a very important verse and the same thing. The the Apostle Paul telling the young pastor Titus, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that one this man is warped and sinning. He is telling Titus, this young pastor, hey, you have a guy there that he keeps bringing division everywhere he goes. There's division brought. You then you give him an admonition. An admi- admon- admonish means to warn. You warn him, and he says after the second warning. Kick him out of the church. He's warped and he's sinning. This is in some ways unpalatable to our modern conscience, but we wonder why so many churches are so unhealthy um, when we allow misers into leadership and they're wounding people, but they're wealthy. And we can keep paying our bills, but that person is that person is a self-centered, um, greedy egomaniac, but he, he gives a lot of money to the church, so we let that person stay there, and he's causing people to vomit all the time and harming people, and I think that there is a time to call a miser a miser. So in dealing with people, there's a lot of wisdom here. Now, on the flip side of that, though, the interesting truth is is that on the, on the very opposite side, it's very possible that someone can be a real Christian, and they may be acting like a miser for a short period, and we need to be able to make a difference, because that person, we need to bail, bear with the weaknesses of the weak, as Galatians says. We need to bear with the scruples of the weak, and, and the person, and so the distinction is, we don't just go around and say, oh, well, you're doing this wrong, you're doing, you guys need to get out of the church. The distinction is, is, are they a believer? What are they in their heart? That can be difficult to determine at times. You need people we need people, more people in leadership in the church who have real discernment. But to discern, hey, this person's a real believer, but they, they, made, a, they made some mistakes, you know. And so it, as a man thinks in his heart, as he really is, it, it, in his spiritual life, he's been born again. So we show that person grace, if you're following what I'm saying. So, And then the second point, let's move on to this one. In dealing with your Flesh. So as with this concept of, of with a miser being a miser, um, it's not so much what you do, but who you are that is important, what's going on on the inside. I want you to listen to what Watchman Nee says um, in, on page 95 of The Spiritual Man. <coughs> in dealing with your flesh. 
Upon reciting many deeds of the flesh in his Galatian letter, the Apostle Paul then points out that, quote, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, Galatians 5.24. Here is deliverance. Is it not strange that what concerns the believer vastly differs from what concerns God? The former is concerned with the works of the flesh, Galatians 5.19. That is, with the varying sins of the flesh. He is occupied with today's anger, tomorrow's jealousy, or the day after tomorrow's strife. The believer mourns over a particular sin and longs for victory over it, Yet all these sins are but fruits from the same tree. While plucking one fruit, and he says parenthetically, actually one cannot pick off any, outcrops another. One after another they grow, giving him no chance for victory. On the other hand, God is not concerned with the works of the flesh, but with the flesh itself. Galatians 5.24 Had the tree been put to death, would there be any need to fear lest it bear fruit? The believer busily makes plans to handle sins, which are the fruits of while forgetting to deal with the flesh itself, which is the root. No wonder that before he can clear up one sin, another has burst forth. We must therefore deal today with the source of sin. (coughs) And so there is this truth here in dealing with yourself. So many Christians, particularly babes in Christ, as he goes on to talk about in the next section, are so focused on getting their act together, on getting, um, on dealing with the sins. And actually, in my experience, I've been working with the Lord for a long time, I think a lot of you have, we always kind of revert back to that mindset, you know, just I need to get my act together, you know. I feel like I've actually just this week come out of this trance um, where I've been sort of doing my own thing and focused on what I'm doing outwardly while letting my inner life, that, that, that place where there should be com- sweet communion with the Lord by being fully surrendered to him and, and, being, and wanting his will has been lacking and I'm focusing on the outward, you know, not so much in lewd and lascivious and things like that, but my life became more about almost entirely about what was going on outwardly and not so much what was going on inwardly, which is is really not good. We need to be strongly aware of our inner life and be fully surrendered to the Lord in our heart. And this truth here, though, that he's talking about is that particularly young believers tend to focus so much on, oh, I need patience, so I need to do stuff that'll make me patient, you know? And, and um, I, I'm sorry, someone's going to hear this and get offended, but, you know, the, these topical remedies that people have, like I heard recently about um, people who are into um, oils, you know, and, and I'm not really against like the essential oil thing. I think that it, there, you know, it could probably help you with asthma or something like that. I'm sure there's some reality to some of those things. But recently, you know, there's there's someone sent out a list of things that these oils can help you with. And it was like among the other things on the list was anxiety, um, stress. And uh, a lot of these other things, and, and, and what surprised me was, is, you know, it, it was a Christian sending, sending this out, and I guess I'm not going to totally discount that it might, you know, smelling peppermint might relieve stress to some degree or another, but it just struck me as odd that Christians were, like, giving each other oil as a remedy to stress and anxiety and fear. Um, I guess that just kind of strikes me as odd because there are so many remedies so plainly laid out in Scripture. You know, as we've talked um, ad nauseum about Philippians 4, 6 through 7, 4, 6 through 8, um, there is a perfect prescription for anxiety there, but many people fail to walk the entire three verses out. But the thing is, aside from that, it's not about getting your act together. It's not about getting rid of the outward things. It's really about what's going on in your heart. And I have to say, I think using oils to relieve stress, while it probably does in some way or another, maybe temporarily relieve some stress, the, the boss is still going to be there the next morning. You know, the, 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 the sickness is still going to be there the next morning. The fear of the future is still going to be there the next morning. It's not a permanent solution to it as anything outward wouldn't be a permanent solution to it in the way that I believe Jesus would desire. So in dealing with your flesh, his point here and my point here is that it's an internal, internal issue. It's dealing with your heart. Are you, as we're going to kind of see later in this, this concept we're considering, are you operating in the flesh or are you operating in the spirit? Because whether we like it or not, 
you're always doing one or the other. You are operating in the flesh today for the last three hours, last five hours, last eight hours, last two weeks, or you've been operating in the spirit for the last hour, last five hours. And, and hopefully God will give me grace to um, fully dissect that difference as we're going to try to in a little bit. But progress in the Christian life, it's really not about focusing on your mistakes. It's really not about focusing on those things that you know are unpleasing to the Lord. Actually, that just causes you more stress and frustration and causes you to <laughs> do those things even more. And that's the, the interesting paradox that many believers find themselves in as they focus on the works of their flesh and on that thing that they do, gossip or, or um, whatever it is. <clears throat> you know, coarse jesting, whatever, that thing that they know that, that they're very aware of, that they want to change, you know, and maybe they're tempted to apply some sort of external remedy to it, you know, maybe something they read in a book, you know, well, go go walk around the neighborhood, you know, or that stupid song that's on Z88 right now that says, um, uh, <laughs> I know, right? Where the, 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 the chorus is, God is saying to me, just breathe, just breathe. And I'm just like, what? Yeah. What? I, I missed that verse. I missed that verse in the Bible where you're stressed out and, and God said to, to Abraham, Abraham, just breathe. Just count to 10, buddy. Just go find a quiet place and count to 10 before you talk to your kids. Just breathe. Yeah. Oh, that's what I, <coughs> Do you guys know what I'm saying, though? That song is ridiculous. Ridiculous to me. It drives me insane. <coughs> Just breathe. I'm sorry. I missed that verse. That's no, it, I'm not mistaken, right? Maybe I missed it. Maybe I have like a weird version of the Bible. So that doesn't say that in your Bible anywhere, right? Where God said to somebody, you know. Be still and know that the Lord is God. Yeah. And just breathe. And just breathe. <laughs> just breathe. No, the, the just breathe thing is completely bogus. That's an external remedy to a heart problem. You know, Psalm 4610, what you're saying, be still and know that I am God. Being still, entering a place of rest, and then by belief, acknowledging that God is in control, as it says, you know, that though the mountains be removed and cast into the midst of the sea in Psalm 46, though the nations rage, do all these things go on, it comes down and says, cease striving is actually literally what it says, cease striving and know that I am God. That's not, that didn't, you know, that, that concept... Just breathe, really? That's the, oh, that's the solution to my problem. I need to just meditate, you know, do some yoga. And, and I'm here to tell you guys, those things may have some sort of topical value. I'm sure that there's some, you know, smelling peppermint may relieve stress. I know that. You know, things like that. Um, but it doesn't have that lasting value. There's not that exchange that God desires. Because let's just be really clear. One of the main reasons he allows and in some cases causes hard times to come into your life is to create an opportunity for there to be an exchange between the two of you that maybe hasn't been there in a while. Um, not, not to have some sort of topical thing. So this idea here in dealing with your flesh, don't get so caught up in, in the things, that you, in your actions, and so focused on trying to to quash those actions and to get rid of those actions. You need to deal with the root. And, and watch when he goes into it, and hopefully I'll be able to elaborate upon this clearly. So the third point here, and this, um, this point is really the longest, um, <clears throat> in dealing with yourself, it gives us wisdom, this idea that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It, it, it gives us wisdom on, in dealing with ourself. Now listen, as I read on, what Watchman Nee says as it moves on. <clears throat> Here we find the contrast between the fall of man and the operation of the cross. The salvation provided by the latter is just the remedy for the former. How fitting indeed they are to each other. Firstly, Christ died on the cross for the sinner to remit his sin. A holy God could now righteously forgive him. But secondly, the sinner as well died on the cross with Christ so that he might not be controlled any longer by his flesh. 
Only this can enable man's spirit to regain its proper rule, make the body its outward servant and the soul its intermediary. In this way, the spirit, soul, and the body are restored to their original position before the fall. If we are ignorant of the meaning of the death herein described, we shall not be delivered. May the Holy Spirit be our revealer. Quoting, those who belong to Christ Jesus refers to every believer in the Lord. All who have believed in him and are born anew belong to him. The deciding factor is whether one has been related to Christ in life, not how spiritual one is or what work he does for the Lord, nor whether he has been freed from sin, has overcome the passions and desires of the flesh, and is now wholly sanctified. In other words, the question can only be, has one been regenerated or not? Has one believed in the Lord Jesus as his Savior or not? If he has, no matter what his current spiritual state may be, in victory or in defeat, he has... Quote, crucified the flesh, has crucified the flesh. The issue before us is not a moral one, nor is it a matter of spiritual nor is it a matter of spiritual life, knowledge, or work. It simply is whether he is the Lord's. If so, then he already has crucified the flesh on the cross. The meaning clear, clearly is not that of going to crucify or in the process of crucifying, but has crucified. It may be helpful to be more explicit here. We have indicated that the crucifixion of the flesh is not dependent upon experiences, however different they may be. Rather, it is contingent upon the fact of God's finished work. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, the weak as well as the strong, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You say you still sin, but God says you've been crucified on the cross. You say your temper persists, but God's answer is that you have been crucified. You say your lusts remain very potent, but again, God replies that your flesh has been crucified on the cross. For the moment, will you please not look at your experience, but just hearken to what God says to you. If you do not listen to his word and instead look daily upon your situation, you will never enter Enter into the reality of your flesh having been crucified on the cross. Disregard your feelings and experience. God pronounces your flesh crucified. It, therefore, has been crucified. Simply respond to God's word and you shall have experience. When God tells you that, quote, your flesh has been crucified, you should answer with, Amen. Indeed, my flesh has been crucified. In thus acting upon his word, you shall see your flesh is dead indeed. The believers at Corinth had indulged in sins of fornication, jealousies, contentions, party spirit, lawsuits, and many others. They were plainly carnal. True, they were babes in Christ. Nevertheless, they were of Christ. Can it actually be said that these carnal believers had their flesh crucified on the cross? The answer, undeniably, is yes. Even these had had their flesh crucified. How is this so? We should realize that the Bible never tells us to have ourselves crucified. It informs us only that we were crucified. We should understand that we are not to be crucified individually, but that we have been crucified together with Christ, Galatians 2.20 and Romans 6.6. 6. If it is a crucifixion together, then the occasion when the Lord Jesus was himself crucified is that moment when our flesh too was crucified. Furthermore, the co-crucifixion is not inflicted on us, on us personally, since it was the Lord Jesus who took us to the cross at his crucifixion. Wherefore, God considers our flesh as crucified already to him. It is an accomplished fact. Whatever may be our personal experiences, God declares that those, belong, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. In order to possess such death, we must not give too large a place to discovering how or to noticing our experience. We should instead believe God's word. God says, my flesh has been crucified, so I believe it is crucified. I acknowledge that what God says is true. By responding in this fashion, we shall soon encounter the reality of it. If we look at God's fact first, our experience will follow next. <clears throat> so there comes in the life of the believer that painful period where he or she becomes keenly aware of the disparity of what he or she believes and how they live. And I'd imagine there's a possibility that there are, some, there are people here in that experience that that may be the description of your experience lately in the Christian life, that experience of, I believe this, I believe this about myself, I believe this about God, but I just keep sinning all the time. Why is there this insane disparity, this incredible disparity between what I believe and what the Bible says about me and what I actually experience on a daily basis? Let me ask it this way. 
it's tempting at those periods in your life, more than tempting, because the tempter will come to you and tell you that you there's something wrong with you that's never been a problem for any other believer and the Bible doesn't cover. And so you're kind of out to luck. You might not even be a believer um, because of this disparity between what you believe and how you live. And, um, and so it can be more than tempting at times to feel that way. <clears throat> Listen to what Nee says moving on from here. And I apologize, I am quoting heavily tonight from this, but he just, he so thoroughly um, delineates all of these truths that it's just better if I read some of them. <clears throat> from God's perspective, these Corinthians did have their flesh crucified on the cross with the Lord Jesus, but from their point of view, they certainly did not have such an experience personally. Perhaps this was due to their not knowing God's fact. Hence, the first, steps toward, first step towards deliverance is to treat the flesh according to God's viewpoint. And what is that? It is not in trying to crucify the flesh, but in acknowledging that it has been crucified. <clears throat> not in walking according to our sight, but according to our faith in the word of God. If we are well established on this point of acknowledging the flesh as already crucified, then we shall be able to proceed in dealing with the flesh experimentally. But if we waver over this fact, the possibility of our def def definitely possessing it will escape us. In order to experience co-crucifixion, we must first set aside our current situation and simply trust the word of God. So what do we do? What do we do with this disparity? Is, this, is there something wrong with us? Please turn with me to Romans 7. <clears throat> and I'm sure you guys know where we're going with this. Romans 7, 13 through 25. So there is actually the, the blessed truth that we're not alone in that, that experience, though God does want us to move beyond the experience of the carnal believer who um, it's outlined here in Romans 7 as Paul is speaking. Um, and hopefully we'll, we will leave this with uh, the, uh, these freeing truths that are so important. So Paul speaking here, has then what is good become death to me, speaking of the law? Certainly not, but sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. <clears throat> I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So, why does... Firstly, why does God allow this? Why does he allow this period in the life of believers where, how can this be God's will? I mean, we understand the Apostle Paul went through it and he's talking about it, but how, it, it, it's pretty scandalous to consider that this is God, how can this be God's will? Well, there are several things, truths in this passage and in the correlating ideas that bring to light the tr those truths. Now, it's important to understand that this period of carnality has a corresponding picture in the Old Testament. Does anybody know what, what season it is representative of this period of this carnality? 
judges? Yeah, actually, yeah. I was actually thinking of a different point, but you're absolutely right. The judges were were. Um, it's a different. It's a different part of the Old Testament, but it's. You're exactly right. It's picturing the same exact thing. I was thinking um, specifically about the wilderness. The wilderness is also a picture in the same way that the judges were later. Um, it, the judges kind of outline <laughs> a lot of truths about this period of carnality, about how the people did what was right in their own eyes, and they would serve the Lord for a period, and then they would they would regress. So that's true too. Um, but you guys know that Egypt was representative of the world. Pharaoh is representative of the devil. Moses representative of the law, and God uses <coughs> Moses to cross the Red Sea, representative of salvation, and then they go into the wilderness, and they come to Kadesh Barnea in actually a relatively short period of time, within a couple months. They come to Kadesh Barnea, they send the spies in, the ten morons, and then Joshua and Caleb, and they come back, and Joshua and Caleb give a good report, and they're like, let's take the land, and the other ten guys are like, oh man, we're like grasshoppers, you know, and so the, the people fail to go into the promised land, because they didn't believe that God was capable of doing what he said, and his promises were essentially too good to be true, and so they wandered in the wilderness, and so the truths that they learned in the wilderness correlate to these truths here, actually, that that period of floundering, that period where they're not enjoying all that God had for them, and they're not taking the land, they're not overcoming enemies, they're just wandering around until something died, until something died until all those people that failed to enter in died. <clears throat> and so those truths correlate here. Um, it says here, Oh, it says, interestingly enough, in verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. So one of the first things um, that God, uh, one of the first reasons God allows this period in our life uh, is to show us what is really in our flesh. Oftentimes, as Neewood talks about in, in, in his book, oftentimes at this period in the Christian's life, they are uh, they are operating in the flesh all the time. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're living in selfishness. They're living in pride. They're, they're living in self-righteousness, whatever. And in the same way, they may not all the time be um, out there doing all kinds of really nasty sins that we're also aware of, but they're living in the flesh. They're living for their own glory, for their own, com for their own comfort, for their own cause. And so they are operating in the flesh. And then the, these people who often tend to be very self-righteous, that is that they have all the marks of self-righteous people, they give a lot of time and energy because they're trying to work their way into God's favor or whatever, even as a believer. They're often full of good works. They're often in God's house, just like the older brother in the prodigal son passage. He never left the father's house. You know, he was full of good labor and all the rest of it, and yet his heart was not with God. He was operating in the flesh. And so oftentimes the young believer and even older believers are operating in the flesh, and the truth is that a person who's operating in the flesh, say they're leading worship or they're teaching the Bible, but they're doing it in the strength of their old nature and their own intellect and wisdom, or the person's leading worship, but they're really doing it subtly. They're not even honest with themselves, but they're doing it because they like the praise of people, which is an ugly thing in God's sight, by the way, that person, whether they realize it or not, they're a worship leader. They've been following the Lord 10 years, and yet all of a sudden, they fall into pornography. They fall into an immoral relationship. They fall into an old habit that they used to have, whatever. And they're like, how did this happen? I was walking so good with God. You know, I'm full of all these good works. And the truth is, dude, you were in the flesh the whole time. A, fall, a downfall that you actually recognized was sin was imminent the entire time because the entire time you were actually operating in the flesh. And when a person is operating in the self-righteous um, aspect of the flesh, the unrighteous side is waiting to just gobble you up. It's waiting to just go on a rampage. That person who is operating in self-righteousness, pride, for their own comfort, for their own purposes, for whatever it is, who's operating in the flesh and they're not doing horrible deeds, it is inevitable that sooner or later you will have strengthened the flesh to, to the degree that that downfall will be, um, you will be unable to resist it. And that was my experience for so long. I remember in my early 20s, 
I, if you asked me, like when I would struggle, I would fall back into like pornography. If, if you had asked me, I would have, I would have straight up told you, dude, I don't feel like there's anything I could have done to resist it. I tried and I tried and I tried and the pull back into it was irresistible. And if that's your situation now, I tell you the truth. The victory is not about the pornography at all. It's not about, oh, I, I'll just never lust at any girls. And if I can keep myself from lusting at the girl crossing the street, then I won't, then I, it won't be as strong. And there's a truth to the fact that when you give into one lust, the next lust is stronger. But the real fact is, is you have to cut the tree off at the roots and it actually has nothing to do with lust. It actually has nothing to do with your thing is, you know, girls don't tend to struggle with lust so much. Girls tend to struggle more with more subtle sins like pride or, or <coughs> um, vanity or whatever it is um, or things along those natures. But the truth is if you, if you become cognizant of it and it's become ugly to you, the truth is it's not even about that. The, the key to overcoming those, those periods where like, I couldn't stop myself from giving into this is by operating in the spirit and not in the flesh. But so um, I'm going to read what Nee says about it, about this, this first reason that God allows us, because it is, it is absolutely fantastic the way he puts this on page 121. Oh, but how can a believer see what God has seen? God is so adamant against the flesh and its every activity, yet the believer appears to reject only its bad features while clinging affectionately to the flesh itself. He does not reject categorically the whole thing. He instead continues to do many things in the flesh. He even assumes a self-confident and proud attitude about it as though he were now rich with God's grace and qualified to perform righteously. The believer is literally making use of his flesh. Because of such self-deceit, the Spirit of God must lead him over the most shameful path in order to make him know his flesh and attain God's view. God allows that soul to fall, to weaken, and even to sin that he may understand whether or not any good resides in the flesh. This usually happens to the one who thinks he is progressing spiritually. The Lord tries him in order that he may know himself. As you guys know, Psalm 139 says, Often the Lord so reveals his holiness to such a one that the believer cannot but judge his flesh is defiled. Sometimes he permits Satan to attack him so that out of his suffering he may perceive himself. It is altogether a most difficult lesson and it is not learned within a day or a night. Only after many years does one gradually come to realize how untrustworthy is his flesh. There is uncleanness even in his best effort. God consequently lets him experience Romans 7 deeply until he is ready to acknowledge with Paul, I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. Verse 18. How hard to learn to say this genuinely. If it were not for countless experiences of painful defeat, the believer would continue to trust himself and consider himself able. Those hundreds and thousands of defeats bring him to concede that all self-righteousness is totally undependable, that no good abides in his flesh, such dealing, however, does not terminate here. Self-judgment must continue for whenever, and then he goes on. <clears throat> so this first reason that God allows it <coughs> is so that you might know to the deepest extent your own heart and how untrustworthy your own strength and your own intellect and your own will and your flesh are. So the second thing, the second reason that God allows this season in our life or, or, or brings us to a plain point where we're on this path and we're, we cannot get free because we're operating in our own strength. The second reason is so that you might stop looking to yourself or into yourself, but off to the Savior. And my, my point here is that you might stop looking to yourself as the answer or your own strength as the answer, so that you might stop looking in yourself, but off to the Savior off to the Savior. This is victory, and he says it here. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So up until that point, he's looking inward, right? He's looking inward, and, and there's this very strong sense that he's like, why can't I be free of this? The me, inside me, the, the, the me that wills to do good, <coughs> I don't find the strength to, do, to, to overcome. And he's been looking inside for the strength. And if you read it over and over again, you'll come to that conclusion. Up until verse 24, he's looking inside at himself and he's saying, I will to do good. Why can't I do good? Because you're not the source of good. 
And it's not until a believer is brought to the point by countless defeats, it, it feels like at times, like Watchman Nee says, that they, it, that they come to this place where they can say genuinely with all their heart, oh, wretched man that I am, deliverance is not inside me. Who? Someone else is going to have to do this. I can't do it. And they know it to the very core of who they are that they stop looking inside themselves as though the one inside themselves, the one who, does, who wills to do good, that the answer lies there. It doesn't. The answer lies in looking off to the Savior and realizing that, that you are not the answer and that you cannot overcome your flesh, you cannot overcome your weaknesses and your, your addictions and things like that. It is only in looking off to the Savior and coming to this place genuinely where you want to be delivered and you know that the, the deliverance does not lie within. Thirdly, the third reason, and this is very important, is to teach us how to operate in our mind. As a man thinketh, or as a man thinks, so he is. To teach us how to operate in our mind. Please catch verse 25. This is a very important verse, <clears throat> and I never understood it until um, it was actually Nee's commentary on it that broke this verse down, finally. I thank my God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind... I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. <coughs> what is he saying there? What he's saying there is that if you're in the flesh, you're serving the law of sin. That's what's there. If you're operating in the flesh, you're serving the law of sin. But if in your mind, and he's going to, we're going to go on into chapter 8 here briefly, and he's going to explain how to operate in your mind and what to do with your mind. But if in your mind you are submitted to the Savior, and you are fully yielded to him, as we're going to explain here shortly, it's with the mind that you serve the law of God, but it's with the flesh. If you're operating in the flesh, you're going to be sinning. It doesn't even matter if you're actually doing things you consider sin or not. If you're operating in the flesh, you're not bringing anything to God that's of any value to him. Now, to clarify, as Paul said, even when you sin now as a believer, it's not you who does it but it's the evil that dwells with you, which is a glorious truth in and of itself, and we could think on, but it's really not the point for tonight. So what 25 is very clearly saying, it's not saying, it's not like a, a command. Okay, so with your mind, this is how you should operate as a Christian. In your mind, you serve God, and it's okay if you sin with your flesh. That's not what it's saying. All it's saying is it's making the distinction. You're either in the spirit or you're in the flesh. And if you're in the flesh, you're serving the law of sin. And if you're in the spirit, operating in your mind, fully surrendered to the Lord, as we're going to see here shortly, then that is how you operate in, 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 in the law of God. So Romans chapter 8, let's move right on to, into that. <clears throat> how then do we do this? <coughs> well, firstly, we understand, um, as Watchman Nee said, that it's, an <coughs> it's a choice and an apprehension of the fact that your flesh has already been crucified with Christ. It's not something you do. You don't have to beat yourself like Martin Luther did. You don't have to, to do things like that to overcome your flesh. Your flesh already has been crucified with Christ. It's a finished work. It's apprehending it by faith and choosing to believe it. In the same way that Romans um, 10, 9 and 10, talks about how you get saved. You get saved how? You get saved by believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. That's how you get saved. So when you believe God's truth in your heart and you confess with your mouth that truth, there is this very real internal change that transpires inside you. You now become a completely different being. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you and is permanently fused to you, and you are, you are um, qualitatively and quantitatively a different creature. And Second Corinthians makes that very clear. Um, so, so when that happens, um, the, the process, though, is by belief and by confession. And in the same exact way, I, I will tell you that the first step to operating in the Spirit, if you've drifted into a period in your life where you've begun to operate in the flesh, the first step to operating in the Spirit is to believe that the work has already been done, just like salvation was. You're not getting resaved, but to believe that you, your flesh has already been crucified with Christ, and then confess the verse. Confess one of the many verses about it, or the, the verse in Galatians that says, those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh, and I'm no longer going to operate in the flesh. Though to be honest, 
there's a little more to it than that in my experience. That's step one. And then steps two, three, and four are right here in Romans 8. So Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, <coughs> I'm not going to go into that verse because I have a very specific view on that verse, but it doesn't pertain to tonight. So um, moving on to verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. <coughs> that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so he says here, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but to those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So this first thing here, we have three points. This keys, keys to walking in the Spirit. Set, subject, or s subject, and spirit. Set, subject, and spirit. And the first one here is set. What do you set your mind on? The person who sets their mind on the things of the flesh will operate in the flesh. As a man thinks, so he is. You are not your mind. You actually, I personally believe that you, the, the essential you is actually spirit, and your mind is just one of the manifestations of your spirit, one of the, the windows that your spirit observes reality and experiences reality. And you can, I believe this very firmly, that you are not just your mind and you can't control yourself. The Bible says very clearly in, in quite a few places that you can control your mind, in, in of, oftentimes in not so few words, but that you can control your mind. You can take every thought captive and that there are certain guards that you can do and certain actions that you can take. And so this idea of being able to set your mind on the things of the Spirit, well, what are the things of the Spirit? They're, they're, we could describe them in many different ways, but as I was thinking about this, I went back to Philippians 4, 8, where it talks about um, letting the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, guard your hearts and minds, Guard your hearts and minds. And then it says, meditating on things that are holy, pure, praiseworthy. If there's anything just or noble, meditate on these things. Set your mind on spiritual things. You actually have the, belief, the ability to do that. Now, at this point, some people who would hear this are going to falter and never experience victory because they're going to say, ah, it's too hard, I can't do that. I've tried. I've tried, and it, it, it was too taxing for the two or three days I tried to do it. I couldn't do it. It was like training wheels. I busted my face, you know, on the fence. I actually did. I busted my face on the fence when my <coughs> first time I went without training wheels. And a lot of people give up after that, and they're like, that's too hard. Or you'll say, well, this, is, this actually is possible. This is actually possible to set my mind on spiritual things. Or you can set your mind on fleshly things. What are fleshly things? A lot of things. The world, you know? Getting your mind focused and set on um, provision, on all of the, on whatever, on fleshly things, everything that pertains to your flesh, then you'll operate in the flesh. As a man thinks, so he is. As he thinks in his heart, so he is. Set your minds. What do you set your mind on? It says very clearly here that if you set your mind on carnal things, you'll walk in the flesh. And if you set your mind on spiritual things, you'll walk in the spirit. So that's step two. <clears throat> and then he goes on here. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. Again, this truth here that you have been crucified with Christ, if Christ is in you. It's already been done. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. This idea of being subject, this, in my opinion, in my spiritual experience, and even recently, is the key when you've been walking with the Lord for a long time. Um, are you willing, at this moment, to do whatever God tells you to do tonight? Are you, at this moment, willing to do whatever God tells you to do tomorrow? Because to be completely honest with you, large swaths of my Christian life, I would have to say to you, 
I was subtly unwilling. Uh, for the first few years of my Christian life, I wasn't willing to um, do whatever God called. If, if God called me to take my family to bonga bonga land, I wasn't willing to do that. And it kept me from, a, from fully and freely walking in the Spirit. In, in, in recent times, in recent years, there were large, sad, sadly large swaths of my Christian life where I was not willing to leave my, God, my job. <laughs> like a funny Freudian slip there, huh? I wasn't willing to leave my, my job. And, and, God, and the Holy Spirit even asked me a couple times, and I remember this very distinctly a few years ago. Just I, I don't remember if I was praying or what, but I really felt strongly that God just asked me in my heart, you know, if I called you to leave your job right now, would you be willing? And I just, uh, my honest, sadly, my honest answer was no, I wouldn't. I like my job too much. I like the the status I have in my job. Uh, Growing up really poor and, um, uh, you know, without a father and all of those things had a very deep problematic impact on my life where the idea of making a living and... uh, and the security and the status of having a good job, a job that's perceived as techno- technological and, and all of those things was, was something that I so deeply yearned for from the time of being a young kid to, to being important, being needed, being valuable, being, um, having a, a certain status. And in, in, a, in a very bad way, um, <clears throat> I was unwilling to leave that. So many times in my life, there was something in the way. You know, there was always, there's always, I love that Switchfoot song, there's always something in the way. There have been so many periods in my Christian life for months, weeks on end, where if, if, if I had been asked, hey, are you completely willing to do whatever God tells you to do today or tonight? My answer would be, no. No, I'm not. What if he tells me to go witness to my neighbor? What if he tells me to go to sell everything I have and go to Bonga Bonga land? What if he does? I'm not willing to do those things. And I tell you the truth, let, as James says, that man's a double-minded man. Let not that man think he'll receive anything from the Lord when you ask for wisdom. That's actually the crux of what James is saying there in James chapter 1. He's saying don't come to God and ask for wisdom if you're not willing to do whatever he says. That is, that's, that's double-mindedness, and you're, you're like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the, the wind, completely out of control. And, and the truth is, <coughs> like this, operating in the Spirit, the most important aspect of operating in the Spirit, and the part where I think most Christians fall short, my experience where I have found that in my own sort of self-diagnosis over the years, or the, the God giving me clarity and in my own life, where I fall short is too much of my Christian life I've been unwilling to do whatever he says, no matter what it is, no matter what it is. You must be willing to submit. If you are at a point where if you're honest with yourself, you'd say, you know what, for months, weeks, years, whatever, days, I've been unwilling to do whatever God says because maybe he's told you to go forgive somebody. Maybe he's told you to go do something you don't want to do. Or, and, I, and you have to be careful because the devil will come and try and tell you to do things sometimes you don't want to do too. And so he's aware of this. And if he can harass you into believing that God wants you to do something that you don't have the grace to do and you don't have the ability to do, then there were part, large parts of my Christian, early Christian life where I drew back from God because the devil was whispering in my ear and saying, well, if you, he come to me as an angel of light, as a messenger of God, and say, you know, I, I want you to do blah, 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 blah. <coughs> Move into the ghetto and start a ghetto ministry, you know. And, <laughs> and, and that was my thing. And, and I didn't have the grace to do that. And it, it made me th- just draw back from God and say, you know, I, I don't, I, I can't do that. When God is moving in you, when God is speaking to you, one of the most important truths about that in Philippians 2 Verse 13, it says, for God works in you both to will and to do. You'll have both the inspiration and the will to do that thing that God is calling you to do if it's him. And so that is a very important distinction and a way to, dis- to discern when the devil, it's the devil that's come to you and he's whispering in your ear, I'm God and I want you to do this, yada, 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 yada. Or I want you to do this or whatever. And you need to have an open heart. You need to say, God, if that's God's will, I'm willing to do it. But then as you seek his face, if he doesn't give you the grace to do it, the will and the grace, the will and the strength to do it, it's not him. And throw that away. But you still, even though the enemy will come to you as the voice of God and try and 
throw you off by pretending to be God's voice. You have to maintain an open heart, a willingness to do whatever God says, no matter what it is, to submit. That's been my <coughs> biggest pitfall over the years, the thing that has kept me too, too many times operating in the flesh instead of in the spirit. I wasn't submitted. I wasn't subject, I wasn't subject to the spirit with a whole heart. And it limits what he can do and how he can use us. So the third reason, um, oh, moving on here. So the third, fourth step really, but the third one here in, in Romans 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now this is another argument that, that Nee develops in his book, but it's very important. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Christ who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Sorry, there's, oh, there it is, verse 13. 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live and this is the final point here <clears throat> it's actually by the spirit it's by operating in the spirit that you put to death the deeds of the body and by trusting in the spirit by being fully yielded to the spirit um, that you put to death the deeds of the body so um, I've already gone over our time so I will end there but as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. This truth here, I believe it is this idea of controlling our minds and, and the reality of we are, we end up being what we think about. We don't, we can't like think our way into like being a millionaire. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is what you allow your mind to do or not to do defines who you become. If by faith and by belief in God and your spiritual life, the, the, the essential you, the, the one who wills to do good, as Romans 7 says, if by if the essential you, you control your mind and you keep your mind set on spiritual things and subject to, to, to whatever God wants, submitted, I'm, I, I'm fully surrendered to you, whatever you want, Lord, you will operate in the spirit. But if in your mind, the, the, if, if you're seeing what I'm saying, the crossroads is your mind. So everything really ends up hinging on the battlefield of your mind. What do you do with your mind? As a man thinketh, thinks in his heart, so is he. <coughs> <coughs> Father, I thank you for your word. I pray um, this was a lot to cover in one night, but you know. I pray that these things would bring strength and vitality uh, to our spiritual lives, that all of us, Lord, that we would at this moment be fully surrendered to you. I, my, my, my heart, Lord, my life, it's yours. Whatever you want, whatever you want to do, um, I want to be fully surrendered to you. I want you to have your will in my life. I want, by your spirit, to put to death the deeds of the body, Lord. I pray that every single one of us here in this moment, that we would henceforth be operating in the spirit, Lord. I love you, and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.